Let's get started. First of all, do you guys know what we mean by a pivot point or how it's calculated? Here's the actual formula. It's good to know what the tool you're using is actually measuring. Goes a long way towards figuring out how to use it correctly. The formula for a pivot point is the high and the low and the close of the prior period divided by 3. Okay, high plus low plus close divided by 3. Does anyone know why we don't just take the high and the low and divide by 2? What's the advantage of doing it this way? Danny, no. Um, the high and the low divided by 2 simply gives you the middle of yesterday's trading range. What makes pivot points unique is by adding in the close and dividing by 3, we also take into account where we finish the day, closer to the top or closer to the bottom. So another way of saying it is that a pivot point is a little bit closer to an exponential moving average as opposed to a simple moving average. Simple moving average weighs all the periods evenly. An exponential moving average puts more emphasis on the most recent periods. In the case of pivot points, unlike a moving average, we're averaging one period. Now what that period can is can vary. You know, you can have weekly pivots that measure the prior week. You can measure daily pivots that measure the prior day. For example, but the formula remains the same. It's the highest point reached during that period, the lowest point reached during that period, and where you closed, the closing price. Add all those up, divide by three, that becomes your central pivot point. Okay, on my charts, with my pivot indicator, I mark that in purple, for example. Okay, so it stands out from all the other pivot points. I like to know where the center is. And you can get my pivot indicator, by the way, free of charge. It's up on my website. Also calculates the medians. I just put the link into the chat window for you all. Totally free of charge. And the color code we're looking at is going to be used in that indicator as well. So all of this will apply directly. And I like mine in particular because it doesn't just draw straight lines where your pivot points are and then redraw them the next day. It actually also shows you where your pivot points were yesterday and the day before. In other words, it shows you historical pivots, which is quite useful when I get to the part about how to trade them. Okay, It's good to see not only where they are today, but where they were in history. You'll see why in a few moments. So we have above and below the pivot point, we have what we call support one and support two. Or pardon me, support one beneath the pivot point, above it resistance one. Okay, R1, S1. The formula for these, this is just more of an FYI. You don't have to memorize these, you guys, okay? But just to give you an idea of how they're derived. Okay, once you have the central pivot point, you subtract the high. 
and you multiply by two. And that's what gives you your ledge under your pivot point. We call that S1. Makes sense, right? If you subtract the high, you're going under. For resistance one, we do the same thing, but we subtract the low. So you get the higher end of the range. Okay, so you have R1 above the central pivot point. You have S1 below the central pivot point. And on my trading platform, or an, an, on my indicator, the ones above, the resistance ones, I color them red. That's a reminder that you've reached the top, and it might be time to look at shorts, for example. Okay, so everything above is going to be red. Everything below is going to be blue. The middle's purple. That's how you can orientate your eye on the chart. We go out from there. We're always going from the middle out. So under S1, we have S2. Above R1, we're going to have R2. And here's the formula. Again, you don't have to memorize them. But if we subtract S1 from R1 and subtract that total from your central pivot point, you get the next ledge lower underneath. And same thing, if you subtract S1 from R1, but now add it above the pivot point, you're going to get R2 above it. Everybody still with me? Cool. All right, let's keep going. Because above R2 and below S1, or below S2, we have one other set, support three, resistance three. You subtract the pivot from the highs, multiply that by two, subtract that from your lows, so you're going under, and you get your next ledge underneath S3. Subtract the lows from the pivot point, multiply by 2, add that above your highs, and you get another ledge above called R3. These are your main pivot points. There's always going to be seven of them. Sometimes people ask, well, why is there no S4? Well, very simply, if you go down, keep in mind they're calculated on your highs, your lows, and your close, right? So if during a day of trading price drops far enough to hit an S3, keep in mind you've made lower lows. So the next day when your pivots are recalculated, your pivots will move down. So in other words, you don't move beyond S3. Once you get to S3, the pivots themselves move down. And you land once again somewhere here. Part of the reason that pivots that show you historical levels are better because you can see that shift down in pivot points. You see what I mean? You never really go out of the range. The range changes to accommodate the price action because all the calculations are, are designed to include those extremes of price movement. So that's the basic configuration of pivot points, you guys. Purple in the middle, three red ones on top, numbered one to three from the inside out, Three blue ones underneath, numbered one, two, three, also from the inside out. Okay, let's talk about medians. Medians are kind of the counterpoint to pivot points. A median, very simply, you take any two pivot points, I'll call them pivot one, pivot two, uh, any two pivot points next to each other, I should say, any two adjoining ones. Okay, so S1 and S2, for example. You take any two pivot points, you add up their price, you divide by two, that's your median. 
It's a complicated way of saying a median is exactly halfway between two pivot points. The medians are numbered a little differently because there's seven pivot points. There's going to be six medians, right? Because they're the space in between. They're not numbered from the inside out, however. They start with the lowest one, which is commonly called M0, and they're simply numbered up. Okay? So your M3, for example, will always be between the central pivot point and your R1. There's no other place it can be. Okay, so this is how the order looks now with all the pivots and all the medians in place. And on my indicator, you'll notice medians are dotted lines, pivots are solid lines. So between the color, even if you can't see the full range, because depending on your time frame, you may only see two or three of them. You know, if it's a smaller time frame. Heck, if you go down to the one-minute chart or the five-minute chart, which if you've been to my classes, you know I don't really recommend anyway. But if you're going to ignore that advice, you might only see one pivot point. Okay? Because that's just because you're seeing that much of the chart. But the order doesn't change. If you only see the M3 on your chart, you can count on the fact that if you go up, you will eventually hit your R1. If you go down from that, you will eventually hit your central pivot point. So if you recognize dotted or solid, and if you recognize the order of the colors, even if you only see a piece of your chart, you can instantly know where you are in the overall scale. Okay, let's talk about movement now how price typically moves from pivot to pivot. First of all, you know, I usually have on my charts, I'll have pivot points, I'll have some moving averages, and I'll have some fibs on my chart. So my first job in the morning, I don't always use all of them. Okay, this is an important point to keep in mind. Because if I got in and got out at every single line on my chart, A, I would always be trading, and B, all my trades would be 5 to 10 pips in size. Not every line on your chart is necessarily an entry or exit point, you guys. What you got to determine first is what the market is paying the most attention to on any given day and you simply look for where your candles are snapping to you know look at the ends of your wicks look at the point where the body becomes the wick if they're resting right on a Fibonacci level probably fibs are going to be more important than pivots that day if the snaps are ignoring your fibs, but snap right to a pivot point, that's when you go, aha, I'm in pivot point mode. Okay, so based on what the price action touches, it tells you which indicator is more important at any given time. You just have to observe. Okay, and let's say price is moving down, price is moving down, it hits the S1, and right on the S1, it bounces up. Not at a moving average, not at a fib, not at a median, but right on the S1, you know, you get a body close, you get another body open, and price starts moving up from there. Instantly, that should put you in pivot point mode. First of all, you know you're watching that indicator more closely than any other. And if the bounce happens to take place at S1, more than likely, price is going to go to R1. Unless some other piece of news interrupts it midway in its journey. Okay? So a bounce at S1 almost always goes to R1. 
If you're coming up, you're coming up, and you get a bounce down at R1, chances are it's going to S1. So in other words, the very same thing works in reverse. That's why I wrote it out the way I did it. Okay, R1 goes to S1, S1 goes to R1. If your bound, if your move down doesn't stop at S1, it doesn't stop at M1, but suddenly you get to S2 and you get a bounce, bounce to the upside. More often than not, unless something else interrupts it, that move is going up to R2. If you get a bounce down at R2, more often than not, that move is going to go down to S2. Same thing in reverse. I very often get the question, well, the central pivot point. You know, sometimes that determines the tone of the day. For example, if early on in the day you find resistance under the central pivot, very often, at least the first part of the day, most of the price action will be bearish. If you start your day by finding support above the central pivot, usually the first part of your day is bullish. So people get asked, well, what if midday I get a bounce at S2? Should I worry about getting out at the central pivot point? The answer to that really depends on how strongly price is moving. Sometimes you go straight from S2 up to R2. Sometimes you stop and pause and find resistance at the pivot point for a while, and then the second half of the move continues later. So how do you know whether to take it as one trade or split it up into two trades? You simply watch what your price action, your indicators are doing as you get to the central pivot point. If your candles start getting smaller and your wicks start getting longer, might be time to take profit. If you get up here and your indicators are starting to round off, might be time to take profit. If you come up here and your candle remains long and you close up here, instead of under the pivot point, if your indicators are showing no sign of rounding off when you get here, probably you can take it all as one foul swoop and keep going. It might come down after breaking to retest this as support, but it should keep going. ADX is another indicator I like. Set to the standard setting of 14. I usually black out the D, DI plus and DI minus lines, and I just focus on the average line, the thicker one, because that measures strength. If my strength is under 30 when I get to the central pivot point, usually that'll be a bounce instead of a break because I don't have enough strength to break through. If my ADX is 30 or more when I get to the central pivot point, usually that's when I have enough strength to break through and keep going. And like I said, any move down will just be to retest this from the other side as support which, by the way, breaks retest, far from getting out, are a good opportunity to trail your stop because now you've established a new support level, maybe even add to your trade for the second half. Once you break a level and retest it from the other side, that's a surefire sign that you're going to go further. See, this stuff really isn't that complicated once somebody explains it to you. A lot of times people just go off of assumptions with pivot points. And that's when mistakes can happen. Continuing on, if you make it all the way down to S3 and you get a bounce there, you're going to go to R3. If you get a bounce down under R3, you're probably going to go to S3. Okay, so it's always the corresponding number. In other words, yeah, it's valid on all time frames, correct. Because when it's set to 14, 
it's going to calculate 14 of those candles on that time frame or not. So on a daily chart, ADX is measuring 14 days. On a one-minute chart, ADX is measuring 14 minutes. But it's always going to be appropriate to the time frame that you're trading on, correct? And it kind of makes sense, really. Right? If you're trading on a one-minute chart, your question is, do you want to sit out for a couple minutes or not? Or stay in for a couple more minutes or not? Right? When you're on an hourly chart, your question is, do I want to stay out for a couple hours or not? Or stay in for a couple hours longer? So everything's always relative to the time frame you're on. I don't use indicators that aren't. If you had to change strategies every time you change time frames, that, that would be silly. Everything I use, moving averages are based on averages. Fibs are based on percentages. Everything I use is always scalable to the time frame in hand. I simply don't touch any indicators that aren't. Uh, Boyke, which time frame is best to use pivot points? Any time frame. If you had a bounce at, R th at S3 and you're expecting resistance at R3, and R3 equals, you know, whatever, 1.4308, that 4308 level is going to be resistance no matter what time frame you're looking at it. On, you see what I mean? It's about the price level. It's about where resistance is. doesn't matter what time frame you're on. Resistance is resistance. Sort of like round numbers. Right? 1300 for gold. It's probably going to be a support or resistance level when you get to it doesn't matter if you're looking at it on a five-minute chart or a daily chart. 1,300 is a round number and is going to be support or resistance. Same goes for any price level that the pivot points are marking. I'm going to get into calibration in a minute, Jen. Okay, as soon as I finish movement, because I haven't done the medians yet, um, the main reason we have to calibrate daily pivots is because Forex is a 24-hour market, unlike futures, unlike stocks. So what is the start and end of a day in a 24-hour market? Oh, midnight, you might say. Okay, midnight where? I would say. Not all countries celebrate midnight at the same time. So that's why some calibration needs to take place on the daily pivots to get the start and end of the day lined up regardless of what broker you're using and what country they're located in. Weekly pivots, there's no reason to calculate because I don't care where your broker is. I'm willing to bet they're not taking trades on Saturday. You see what I mean? Weekly, there's a little more agreement as to when the week opens and when the week closes. Once New York starts out, stops on Friday, nobody is trading. Once Asia starts on Sunday night, we start a new week. So that, that's why calibration isn't required on the weeklies, but is required on the dailies. And I'll show you how to do that in a moment. That's one of the biggest steps people skip. But it's actually one of the more critical ones. Um, the other part of your question, can daily pivots also be used on the four-hour chart? Again, they're, they're independent of time frame. Resistance is resistance no matter what time frame you look at it. 
you know, I usually don't display them on my four-hour chart just because they end up being too close together and hard to see. In my trading system, I use the four-hour for direction. I do my actual entries and exits on the one-hour chart. So that's why I don't show them on my four-hour chart. They're not really part of the direction decision. You know, and then they at that point, they become clutter. I need them to determine entries and exits, which I do on my hourly, not my four-hour. But if the four-hour is your primary trading time frame, you don't use the hourly, there's nothing wrong with showing your daily pivots on the four-hour chart. See what I mean? I don't do it just because that's not the time frame I make entry and exit decisions on. That's that's the only reason. But there's nothing precluding you from using them. Like I said, they're they're time frame independent. Chuck, be sure you use the chat window, not the Q&A window. Um, glad I caught this. But question was, if price bounces last month on S3, will it go next month to R3? More than likely, yes. It's not tied to last month, next month. Sometimes it can do it in a day, sometimes it can do it in a week, sometimes it takes longer. But as far as price level, independent of time, usually that's the next destination it's going. But remember, you guys, if it snaps to S3, okay, if it reverses a little bit under S3, that doesn't count. If it reverses a little bit above S3, that doesn't count. R3 becomes activated if you reverse right at S3. Well, what if price reverses between M0 or S3? Well, then you're using neither your medians nor your pivot points. You might be using something else like a Fibonacci level. Okay? This only applies when you reverse right on the line. Next to it, above it, below it, in between doesn't count. Only right on it. You need the snap in order to activate it. Uh, Jen, weekly pivots are exclusive to which time frames? I think I've said now three times. Time frame independent. Time frame is irrelevant. We are dealing with price. The price level is valid regardless of what time frame or, in other words, how much you zoom in on it. It's about price. It's not about time. Basically, you got to look where your snap is. If your reversal is at a daily pivot, you're using daily pivots and ignoring weekly ones. If your snap is to a weekly pivot, you're using weekly ones, ignoring daily ones. If your snap is to a median, you're ignoring all solid lines and just paying attention to the dotted lines, okay? None of them are active all at the same time. The price action will tell you which one is more important than the others, okay? If you have a snap and a reversal at S3, and it's a daily S3, right away, your daily R3 becomes active, your medians and your weekly pivots and your fibs become inactive, If it happens to be a weekly instead of a daily, then the weekly ones become active. The daily ones can be ignored for the time being till you get your next snap and your next reversal somewhere. And like I said, if the reversal takes place somewhere between some of your pivots, not right on them, then maybe you're not using pivots at all that day. Maybe it's a Fibonacci day. Okay, so always pay attention to what your price action is doing because it'll tell you what's important at any given time. Okay, Boyke, different time frames can have different supports and resistances. 
Very true. Where is your ADX at? If your ADX is over 30, you will more than likely go to your next long-term target and break through any of those in-between levels. If your ADX is under 30, you're going to have to get out and get back in at each support resistance level you encounter along the way. You go down to the one-minute chart, you're going to be doing a lot more entering and exiting, putting up with a lot more noise for a lot less pips. You start to see why I don't like those time frames. Okay, so whether you have to pay attention to prior highs, prior lows, largely depends on your strength and a little bit on your momentum, whether it's increasing or decreasing. Well, I trade pure price action. I don't rely on any other indicators. Okay, then you have no clue about strength. You have no clue about momentum as you're approaching a level. Take a wild guess and assure yourself you're still using a system. That's my answer to that. How you approach a support resistance level is every bit as important. Are you building strength and momentum as you approach it? Are you petering out and losing strength and momentum as you approach it? I personally consider these very important tidbits of information. So do the in-between levels matter? You know, prior highs, prior lows that are specific to a time frame, Boyke? It really depends on how much strength and momentum you approach them with and whether you're gaining or losing strength and momentum as you approach them. And yeah, I've got some actual chart examples and on. Absolutely, when I get to them. And that's correct, Jen. If you get a snap at S1, well, not just a snap, a reversal, right? A bounce up at S1. If you get a bounce up at S1, and it happens to be the end of the day, yeah, probably the next day you're going to move up to R1 and then get a bounce down at that. You absolutely carry them over from one day to the next, which is the whole point of why my indicator shows you historical pivots and not just horizontal lines. Absolutely. It can be an S2 bounce from Tuesday that takes you to R2 on Friday. Absolutely. Sometimes these pivot points are very close together in their short little moves. Sometimes they can be very long moves in the case of weekly pivots that take several weeks, if not several, several days to complete. You might have to split it up into several smaller trades. But it's nice to know big picture-wise where you're moving from, where you're moving to most likely, and why. Yep, date independent, same as time frame independent. It's about moving from one price level to another price level. Okay, let's talk about medians because the median rules are a little bit different. First of all, you know, same thing. Look for your snap. If you snap and reverse at a solid line, you're going to be paying attention to your solid lines. If it happens to be at a dotted line, you know, then you can ignore your solid lines and start paying attention to your dotted lines. Remember, your medians are numbered bottom to top. There's six of them. They're numbered zero through five. The rule for medians, very simply, and that's why I say first notice if you're paying attention to dotted lines or solid lines, okay? The rule for medians, very simply, skip one, go to the next. Okay, so a bounce up at M0, more often than not, will take you to M2. You see what I mean? You skip M1, you go to M2. A bounce down at M2 will take you to M0. Can anybody tell me if I get a bounce up at M2 where I would go?
M4. Yeah, I said bounce up, Jen. Yeah, exactly. You would skip M3, you would go to M4. And exactly, Jen. It can take three days, it can take three years. Doesn't matter. Um, it can be traced using my indicator. I think if you load my indicator, when I get to the chart examples here in a minute, it'll make more sense. My indicator can trace that. That's the whole point. So you, you get the idea. If you bounce up at M1, you're, going, you're skipping M2, you're going to M3. Same thing happens in reverse. You bounce down from M3, you go to M1. What if you break M3 and you bounce up? You know, you retest it, you get a good snap, and you bounce up from M3. What do you do then? M5. Awesome. Yeah. You guys are getting the hang of this. M2 goes to M4. M4 goes to M2. M3 goes to M5. And M5 goes down to M3. Okay. <coughs> So those are all the movement rules. Where you end depends to, to a large part on where you begin. Okay, let's talk about calibration. Like I said, much more an issue with the daily pivots than it is the weekly ones. Be easy to, pardon me. Be easy to say the day starts and ends at midnight. But midnight is a relative term. So for forex, officially, the start and end of the day is midnight GMT. Jen, fourth time. Time frame independent. Any time frame you wish. I really, monthly pivots are so far apart. Honestly, I don't even have the indicator on my chart most of the time. I'll check it at the start of the week to see if I'm near any of them. And I'll plot it with a horizontal line just so I'm aware of that level. And it'll probably be a couple of weeks before I get to the next level. They're that far apart. So that's personally what I do. I just pop the indicator up, see if I'm near any of them, mark it with a horizontal line, and turn the indicator back off. That's how I use it. On any time frame. 1300 is support or resistance regardless of whether you get to it on the one-minute chart or the daily chart. Price, not time. The price is what matters, not the time frame you look at it on. So, the most of the world has agreed that midnight GMT is the cutoff for the end and the start of a new day. For Forex. Okay? If you're trading futures, and this also goes for stocks and stock indices, the cutoff is 5 p.m., 1700. Note the difference, Eastern Standard Time. Okay, the reason it's the same for both stocks and futures, this is kind of convenient. When it's 5 p.m. in New York and the stock markets are closing, it happens to be 4 p.m. in Chicago, and the Chicago Board of Trade and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange both close at 4 o'clock. So they close an hour apart, but there's an hour time difference. So conveniently, stocks and futures both close at the same time. 1700 Eastern Standard Time. What you need to do now, this is where a lot of the confusion and misconception comes from. 
a lot of people think they need to calibrate their pivots based on where they live. In reality, your time zone has nothing to do with this. Nothing at all. What you have to account for is how your broker's clock is set on their trading server. And this may not even be necessarily where your broker lives or where their office is, okay? Don't just automatically assume, well, my broker is in London. I don't have to adjust my pivot points. London doesn't use GMT. For six months out of the year, London is one hour ahead of GMT, first of all. Okay, so in London in particular, you need to find out, does your broker use GMT or London time? They're not the same things. Does your broker change their clocks or not? GMT doesn't change. London does. Does your broker have their servers in their corporate office? Let's start there. Two-thirds of London brokers have their servers in India or Pakistan. Two-thirds of Swiss brokers have their servers in Russia. So don't just assume because the address on the business card says something, that's their time zone. You could be operating under a false assumption. The good news is, you guys, it's very easy to find out. Okay, what you're going to do, you're going to go down to your one-minute chart. It's probably the only thing I think the one-minute chart is really useful for. Go down to your one-minute chart and look in the right-hand corner, find the timestamp. And you can go to a website... For example, timeanddate.com, that's a really good one. You can go there at any time and find out what the time is GMT. If you use Firefox as your browser, there's a really cool plugin you can download called Fox Clocks. It's fully customizable. I personally have five different time zones that are always showing at the bottom of my browser window, including GMT. You know, I have New York, GMT, Europe, the United Arab Emirates, Japan, and Australia on mine, for example. You know, you can pick your favorites. But it's kind of cool because you can have several world clocks right at the bottom and just glance down. If you don't have that or something similar, you can go to timeanddate.com. So, for example, because it's a major financial center, Ron, I don't trade their currencies, but I do do business with their banks and, and funds. So, yeah, I personally hate it when I get it wrong and wake somebody up at 2 in the morning with a phone call. So I like to check. So, for example, you know, let's say your one-minute chart says 3 o'clock. You go to timeanddate.com, and it tells you right now GMT is 4 o'clock. So your offset becomes minus one. You see what I mean? You are one hour before GMT. If you look up timeanddate.com and it says GMT is two o'clock, your offset becomes plus one because you are one hour ahead of GMT. Make sense? If you look it up and it says GMT is 3 o'clock, your offset is 0. So, first thing you need to do is figure out your offset. 
Do you add or subtract? And how much do you add or subtract? Compare timeanddate.com with the lower right timestamp on your one-minute chart. It's got to be the one-minute chart. What if it's off by a few minutes? What if my chart says 303, but in GMT it tells me 306? Okay, don't worry about the minutes, you guys. You are rounding off to the nearest whole hour, and there's a reason for this. Okay, look where the notch is. See that? The notch is on the left side, not the right side. If I follow up in a straight line where that notch is, there will always be a couple candles after the notch. Doesn't matter. Whole hour, Jeff. Whole hour. Just like with pivot points, you can say four hour, you can say weekly, I'll give you the same answer. You can say three minutes, 12 minutes, 15 minutes, I'll give you the same answer. You're rounding off to the nearest whole hour. The difference in minutes is always going to be the candles after the notch. Okay, we're just comparing when the notch was printed. So basically, where you do this setting let me let me bring up a chart. I don't want to do dollar Swiss of all things. Let me bring up a chart. Let's get it without all the other crap on there. Let me put my pivot point indicator on it. Okay, and you'll have to forgive me. These ones aren't calibrated for color. Oh, yeah, they are. Okay, good. Okay, so I've got my chart. I've got my pivot points on it. What you do is you right-click on a pivot point. It can be any of them, okay? Making the change on one is indicator-wide. It'll make it for any of them. So you right-click on a pivot point. You go right there to Pivot Point SR Properties. Okay, and you go here to input. Second tab over, start hour. That's the value you're concerned with. So if it's midnight GMT and your offset is zero, you're going to put in zero. Make sense? If it's midnight GMT and your offset is plus 2, you're going to add 0 plus 2, you're going to put in 2. What if your offset is minus 2? Well, here's the thing. You're not going to put in negative 2 because you're measuring hours. It has to be a value. Between... 0 and 23. Make sense? So when you subtract, you're not subtracting from 0, you're subtracting from 24. If your offset is minus 2, you would put in 22. Everybody understand what I mean? You either add to 0 or you subtract from 24. And that's your start hour. That's for 4x. That's for midnight GMT.
Okay. For futures and stocks, keep in mind there is currently a five hour difference, and it's different during the summertime, but currently there's a five hour difference between EST and GMT. Okay? EST is five hours behind GMT. So I said 1700 EST for the end of the day on stocks and commodities. 1700 GMT, or sorry, 1700 EST is going to be 2200 GMT, right? 5 p.m. in New York is 10 p.m. GMT, 2200. So your base value is 22 instead of zero, like it is for midnight GMT. And here again, you're going to add or subtract your offset, this time to 22. So if your offset is plus 2, you put in zero. If your offset is minus 2, you put in 20. If your offset is zero, meaning your broker is on GMT, you put in 22. You don't add or subtract anything to it. Make sense? So in other words, your pivot setting will be different on your oil chart than it will from your Euro USD chart. You add or subtract to zero on your Forex charts. Once you figure out what your offset is from your one minute chart, you add or subtract that to zero or 24 for your Forex pairs. For your stock charts, stock indices, commodities, you're going to add or subtract your offset to 22 during the winter months. Once clocks change, you'll be adding or subtracting to 21. Right? Because everything moves forward by an hour. The difference is one less. So it becomes 21 instead of 22 during the summer months. That's because New York changes, GMT does not. So it becomes 21. Your offset never changes. Your offset only changes if you change brokers. Okay, not if you move your house. I'm not sure I understand the question, what is 1900? That's 7 p.m. I think you got something mixed up. I was saying 1700 because it equals 5 p.m. Close of the business day. I'm not sure where you're getting 1900. Okay, but midnight GMT is Forex. We don't care about New York for Forex. We care about New York for stocks because of the New York Stock Exchange. And also, like I said, 4 p.m. commodities. But 4 p.m. in Chicago is the same as 5 p.m. in New York. You're not subtracting the time from 24, Ron. You've got something mixed up. You're subtracting your offset. The difference between your broker's clock and GMT. That's what you're subtracting. Time of day is irrelevant. It's the offset, the difference. Okay? And you make this change once, you guys, it's going to apply to all the pivots. Keep in mind, you have to make this change a second time for the medians. Okay, right-click on any dotted line and make the same change. And then what you might want to do is save it as a template. 
and you might want to call it Forex Summer. Commodities Summer. And then make another set, Commodities Winter. Forex Winter. So anytime you open a new chart, you know, you don't have to go through that configuration process. You just load the appropriate template. And here, Jen, now you can see how the pivots adjust. Okay, whenever they move up and down, that's a 24-hour period of trading. You'll find 24 one-hour candles between each of these vertical lines, and you can see how you can follow with your eye and see where the pivot was yesterday or the day before or the day before that. So the time frame and the date are truly independent. This doesn't count as a bounce at S2, does it? Because it's below. It doesn't count as a bounce at M0 because it's a little above. Okay, well, it would help if I actually calibrate my pivots. I'm GMT plus 2, for example. So let's actually calibrate them correctly. Boom. See how much better that is? See what a difference it is? So there you go, for example. That's more of a cleaner snap. And because it's the second solid line under the purple, I know that's S2. I can also hold my mouse over it. S2 goes to where? R2. Boom. That's how that works. That's pivot points in a nutshell, you guys. Get them calibrated. Know which one corresponds to which one. Either a body or a wick, Jen. Either or. A snap means the market's paying attention to that value. Doesn't matter with what. Just that it's paying attention. My rule for stops, Joseph, is to support resistance level between my entry and my stop. Support resistance can be a prior high or a low. It can be a pivot point. It can be a median. It can be a moving average. It can be a Fibonacci level. But I like to have two supporter resistance levels between my entry and my stop, and then I use a little bit of padding. I don't put it right on the line. Uh, Boyke asked an interesting question. He said he knows I'm in California, so why is my offset plus two? California is not two hours off from GMT. Remember the very first thing I said, Boyke? Has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with where you live. I could live in Antarctica, and I would still use plus two. It has to do with the difference between your broker's clock and GMT, whatever your broker set their server to. It's not even based on your broker's address. Whatever they happen to have their server set to, which you can find out by looking at the rightmost timestamp on your one-minute chart. Uh, correct, Jen. If your offset happens to be plus two and you're trading commodities or stocks, then you would add two to 22, which equals 24, except you're not going to put in 24, right? Because 24 equals zero. Whenever you get to 24, you replace it with zero and keep going. Just like when you're going backwards, 3, 2, 1, 0, the moment you get to 0, you change it to 24 and keep going, 23, 22, and so forth, right? Whenever you get a 24, you change it to 0. Um, no, primarily pivot points. There's some settings changes we do to our fibs. But that doesn't have to do with the time of day, Anand. 
That's different. That has to do with the Fibonacci levels that we track. Which, the same link where you get the pivot indicator, by the way, there's a fibo.pdf document that will show you how to make those Fibonacci modifications. I also cover them in my Fibonacci classes, by the way. Next one is going to be Friday the 27th. What do I use for EST? Not sure I understand. I use EST for commodities and stocks. The 22 setting, which remember is 21 during the summer months. That's for stocks and commodities. And then you add or subtract your offset. Your offset is, depends on you. No. Um, there is an exception to that, Jen, that I should briefly mention. New York doesn't like to use GMT. New York likes to use Midnight EST because, well, New Yorkers think they're the only ones on the planet. Americans do in general. They forget there's a whole other world beyond the ocean. The good news is they're outvoted. There's more Forex traders in the rest of the world put together than there is in New York by themselves. So frankly, it doesn't much matter what New York likes to do. The only difference is after London closes, there's those couple hours when New York is trading by themselves because Asia is not open yet. And you might see your pivot point slipping a little bit during those last hours of New York session. Half the time I forget, and it doesn't affect my trading one iota. But if you happen to notice your pivots are being problematic and New York is trading by themselves, you might want to try Midnight EST. Which would be what? 5 GMT. Right? And then you add or subtract your offset to 5. But half the time, I don't even remember to do that. Okay, I'm going to answer this again, even though I've answered it several times. Any time frame, four-hour chart. Oh, okay. You, you got it, right? Time frame independent. Weekly is not calibrated because we have the miracle of Saturday. Okay. Cool. We got it. A um, couple links for you guys. Remember, you can get the pivot indicator for free. Here's the link one more time for anybody that needs it. Here's a couple other bonus links for you. Um, Daily Night is a newspaper I publish every morning, electronic newspaper at 8 a.m. GMT. Summarizes the most clicked on and most read financial headlines of the day. So if you're looking for an idea of what to trade or what forces might be moving the markets, that's a good place to start. You can either visit that link every morning or you can sign up and have it sent to your, uh, to you either via Twitter or email, whatever you prefer. Here's my own Twitter and Facebook. If you'd like to follow me, keep in touch, whatever. Now, obviously, pivot points are a tool, you guys. They're not a complete system in and of itself. They can be part of a system. It's one indicator, one tool. I've got some recorded workshops that do sum up my entire trading system. All the indicators I use together with pivots to confirm their signals. There's also a uh, very intense coverage of money management, trading psychology, probability and how to use it to your advantage. All sorts of stuff that I feel other trading systems, frankly, leave out. Or if they mention it, they don't go nearly as deep into it as they should. They're recorded. You can watch them at your convenience. If you prefer live training, we also have what I call the pro group. We meet at the end of each trading day. We review what happened during the trading day, and we set up our most likely trades for the next day ahead. We do that every single day, five times a week, 20 times a month. 
And you'll be surprised the cost is less than most of you lose in a trade or two for a whole month of training. Lastly, if you're short on time or short on money, we understand there's something that we call the budget program. This is our weekly video updates. You don't get to interact. You don't get to ask questions. But every Monday morning, we send you our Monday video. Why that one? Because that's where we outline our trades for the week ahead. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your time and attention. Wish you a wonderful second half of the week. And much luck using pivot points. Take care, everybody.